Okay, welcome back then. It is late January 1864 and the beginning of the 14th year of the campaign. And um, been a really interesting few months for more reasons than one. And I'll take you through uh, why. Uh, the first thing is the completion of uh, breech-loaded rifles, um, which is... Uh, I kind of... I've mentioned it in a couple of videos already. Or oh, breech-loaded rifles, I beg your pardon, muzzle-loaded rifles. Breech-loaded rifles is the kind of beginning of modern firearms. So muzzle-loaded rifles, it's not really just a firearm. This serves as a kind of catalyst, really, for wholesale military reform, which has begun in earnest. Uh, we've been seeing over the last kind of um, two months, really, um, the gradual kind of transformation of our army into something completely different. There's a number of ways that this is uh, impacted. One is the raw combat value of our forces. One of the things this combat power represents is not really necessarily the size of the army. When I look at this and think, okay, you know, the Russian army is three times the size of our army. What that really means is it has a raw sort of combat power factor that's three times our size. So in actual fact, it might be twice the size of ours, but it just has a lot more firepower. Um, what we've noticed is a dramatic relative decline in the combat power of uh, potential foes, if you like, or potential opponents. Uh, we can't see Austria. Uh, we, this is kind of a... Uh, intelligence tends to be a little bit mixed in terms of what you get austria and prussia currently are invisible uh, but they tend to reappear after a period of time um so yeah a dramatic increase in the combat power of our forces the effectiveness of our forces they'll be able to move faster further um they'll have more you know like they'll regain cohesion uh, more effectively and so on so it's a wholesale army reform now the other really uh, for me anyway uh intriguing change um is new kinds of uniforms uh, the army kind of has transformed into something that looks very very different from the army that we inherited in 1850 which you know was heavily heavily modeled on kind of european uh, uniform designs especially influenced by the french and um it still is but increasingly now we're seeing the ottoman army come into its own the kind of new uh, 19th century army is beginning to develop its very its own distinctive characters and these are kind of garrison forces this uniform this gray style uniform is quite common we'll find this uh, being used for lots of different kinds of units, including marines sometimes, and um, also militia forces. But yeah, a very, very distinctive um, kind of uniform. That's the new standard issue kind of um, service rifle, and a slightly kind of small affairs, which is slightly more practical. Uh, but yeah, very, very cool um, kind of uniform. Um, if we go to Mehmed Ali Pasha's uh, force, we can see the uh, guard formations. Um, again, very different kind of uniform. Before they had kind of uh, sort of blue trousers, he had a kind of cummerbund, like a white cross cummerbund and this kind of thing. Now you can see more elaborate braiding, Zouave style orientalist kind of influence trousers, which I really, really like. And uh, you can see his little ammo pouch there and the new standard issue kind of rifle. Uh, so, yeah, very stoked about this. You're probably thinking, you know, at some point he's going to stop and just kind of play the game normally, but uh, you'll be wrong. Um, <laughs> uh, line infantry then probably look in sort of uh, kind of summer um summer sort of a uh, battle dress order uh again you know uh, very very different kind of design you've got a light kind of uh, powder blue sort of tunic with ranks now you can see that this looks like it's maybe a corporal or a sergeant rank or lance corporal uh the end of the sleeve uh in sort of uh yeah again conforming to the new kind of european standards that are emerging the ottoman army is not the only one that's doing this you've got the ammo pouch on the front and again it's a bit more of an orientalist kind of design which I really like and you've got the new standard issue rifle um very cool um, new kinds of cavalry as well. Um, the light cavalry in, in this particular variety, one of the things I like about this is it creates some variation of different kinds of light cavalry, different kinds of heavy cavalry, which is really cool. Uh, so this light cavalry, you can see, is heavily influenced by kind of Balkan European, you know, sort of uh, Hungarian sort of Hussar sort of tradition. Really, really nice. And the heavy cavalry... Um, again, I mean, one of the features of the cavalry is it, 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 before it was the least least changed really from the because of the implementation of the nazi Malcha did it looks much um it looks kind of largely the same as it would have in the 18th century if we, in fact i think we have a cavalry division or brigade that is not yet changed now the unit card has changed uh but the actual units look so you can see there's still very 18th century very bright colored kind of uh, traditional kind of middle eastern um sort of cavalry or middle eastern and, and turkish cavalry now they've assumed a much more kind of professional looking character they look like sort of professional soldiers and they have a kind of something um some semblance of a sort of uniform which is quite cool um uh, i don't know what i've just done there 
damn buggy interface. There we go. Let's get that back into Mehmet Ali's uh, force. There we go. Great. So, uh, yeah, light cavalry, um, heavy cavalry. Again, it, this actually looks like a military uniform. Slightly smaller kind of fares, but yeah, very, very nice. Um, I absolutely love this stuff. The really kind of specialized units, these change at a later date. These change on the basis, I think, of a different technology. We say different tech, you know, we, I say technology. It's not really technology, but you get the idea anyway. Um, and let's have a look at some others. I find this stuff tremendously exciting. A, a part of it is because you sort of, you know, you spend um, 14 years with an army that looks, you know, you become very familiar and you get very used to the kind of uniform and stuff like that and it suddenly changes. It's quite cool. Um, I think that might be, for the most part, it. Um, yeah, garrison forces. Sometimes there's a bit of variation between the kind of unit card that's displayed here and, and the front unit card. So... Maybe different ranks would have different kinds of uniforms. You wouldn't necessarily have all soldiers in a kind of grey uniform. So maybe the majority of them would like look like this, but some of the officers would have a more traditional blue uniform. But again, you can see the kind of... One of the things I really like about this is the introduction of kind of uh, more elaborate braiding um, that you can see in the Ottoman uniforms. Again, the original kind of... Um, yeah, the original kind of uniforms were a bit more kind of austere, you know. So they've become a bit more elaborate, a bit more decorative, which is really, really nice. But, yeah, rather stoked, I have to say, <laughs> about this. I'm seeing if there's any other kinds of uniforms that I've missed. And, again, there is a little bit of variation. Um, mixed Brigade. Yeah, so this you can see the light cavalry here. This is quite cool. I mean, you, this the kind of hats. Uh, I can't remember these are called now. Col Colpus? It'll come to me in a minute. But these are the hats that become really distinctive for sort of late Ottoman history, really, especially in the First World War. I think it's a kind of sheepskin type kind of hat. But, yeah, very, very cool. Riding boots and striped sort of uh, joppers and all that kind of thing but yeah great stuff and again the standard infantry but yeah there's a few different varieties um but uh yeah and this will pretty much be the standard pattern uh of our army now uh the new kind of new new model army the new version of the model new model army until probably the 1870s it's going to be like this for a decade or more and um these are the marines what i quite like about this is this unit card for the marines has a kind of white style sort of naval um card um, but actually their uniforms, they use the same kind of uniforms as garrison forces, grey kind of uniforms. So the new kind of grey uniform is really, really common. And that's quite distinctive. That's a bit of a break, really, with the French tradition. So the Ottoman, the new Ottoman army is, is developing its own kind of identity. And, yeah, more than it, it's a kind of, it is a sort of standard issue uniform, unlike the uh, the Ottoman army of the uh, maybe the 18th century. Uh, but it is developing its own traditions and characteristic now. So, yeah, pretty stoked with that. And, um in terms of what's actually happened, well, first of all, let's have a look at Yemen. Now, Yemen really is in the process of consolidation. Uh, we've landed kind of uh, smaller forces now that are occupying the rear. Uh, you can see some, I think I showed you this already, you can see some of the older style uniforms still. Not all units have been kind of uh, changed um, into the new kind of pattern. But um, yeah, the Yemen is being kind of consolidated. The interior of the Yemen is now being consolidated. We've got the emergence of colonial forts, and we're beginning to now... So we, we held off doing this, but we're going to rebuild trade posts and redevelop our kind of commercial presence here, which we hadn't done. It just wasn't something that was doable. It was costing us too much because we kept on losing our trades and stations and missions and things like this. So these things had to follow, really, the pacification. We can really say now um, that a large part of the, the territory is now pacified. Uh, we're in the process of landing a force 16 days away. Um, these are just kind of um, conscript militia brigade using very small forces to hold the interior and uh, yeah, again develop a commercial presence get colonial trade posts and merchants there and this kind of thing and we're doing this block by block and we've really now reduced the kind of independent rebellious Yemeni forces to a really really small kind of sliver of territory um, in the far east of, of the, the region so once we've consolidated this we've got colonial forts we'll look to move in and kind of finish that force off but Yes, yeah, so that's a really good development. The other colonial development is in the 1850s, I think it was 56, 57, I noticed that there had been a rebellion in Zanzibar. Both the, uh, the Prussians and the British had a little bit of presence here. They had a bit of colonial penetration. Uh, but also Oman. Oman has lost all of its... Oman is a small kind of sultanate um, on the south coast. This is really a national polity, a bit like Egypt. Um, it has a, more, a complex enough political system that it's not so decentralized that we can achieve any kind of colonial penetration here. And... It's a bit of a player in its own right. It has some presence, for example, on the Somalian coastline. 
um, in sort of what would become Kenya and um, Tanzania or Tanganyika. Um, so some of these areas have a degree of Omani colonial penetration. In that sense, you know, there's a bit of an Arabic kind of presence in these regions. There's a bit of familiarity. Um, this is a suitable region, therefore, I would suggest for us to look to develop presence. Uh, now, we managed to develop a pretty decent colonial presence over a period of time. We established a trade post, a mission, and this is a really good area. It's a one-tile uh, region, a colony, so it's a Zanzibar as an island. is an independent sultanate of sorts or tribal territory. I'm not sure how it would be characterized. Um, the principal resource in this region is opium, and there's a reasonable amount of it also. And we now have enough colonial penetration that we are actually able to move to protector status to basically plant a flag here and claim this as our own for some reason i can't actually there we go ottoman empire declaring protectorate we're, we're a few turns in and we've got three turns left my suspicion would be that the prussians would lay a stake or maybe the british would try no one has done that uh, so we're looking that we're halfway there to achieving protectorate status that puts that into our sphere of influence and from there on, we'll be looked to kind of achieving um, full colonial status for Zanzibar. The other area that we're beginning to now make a bit of a presence in is the Somalian coastline. Uh, the Italians had attempted to establish both a mission and a trade station in Mogadishu. One of the really good things about this is sometimes colonial revolts, they specifically target a certain faction. It's not like a generic thing like you get in a lot of games where you just have a colonial revolt. It spawns some kind of rebel force which will attack anything, including other rebel forces. That's not actually the case. But what happens is the, the colonials dislike the presence of a particular faction and will target that faction. Uh, that's, for example, happened in um, Yemen. If the British had had a presence here and they landed forces, these Yemeni forces would not have engaged them. Uh, they, they are specifically trying to stop us, you know, probably because they're more. this is more likely to happen once you achieve a much more kind of serious presence there. And given the uh, Somalians have robustly attempted to kind of reject Italian colonial penetration in the region, there's a good chance that we'll be looking at resistance ourselves at some point. However, not at the moment. We're going to look to establish an enclave in Mogadishu. Mogadishu also is an area for natural opium production. Uh, so we're looking to establish ourselves a little bit. In, um, we already have some opium production in Anatolia, in Bursa, uh, but with Zanzibar, Mogadishu and also a consolidated, um, a, you know, a completely consolidated Yemen, which has one, two, three kind of regions uh, where we can naturally produce opium. This establishes us as one of the biggest, would establish us as one of the most significant opium producers in the world, I would suggest. Let's actually have a look at opium. Uh, if I can see it, that's cotton. Uh, opium, here we go. There is actually no one exporting opium in the world at all. If we can consolidate these regions, develop them, exploit these regions properly, we would really be on the map as a, as a meaningful opium producer. So there is a bit of a kind of uh, economic basis for this, but we also want to establish ourselves in the Horn of Africa. What we would look to do upon the consolidation of uh, Yemen is to establish a military force, a permanent military force in Mogadishu. We would establish an anchorage, which we'd look to upgrade into a coaling station, and ultimately we'd put a port here, some military infrastructure and this kind of thing, and then use this as the basis to begin to kind of do the same as what we've done in Yemen. We've got good experience now in suppressing tough colonial territories. We are really beginning to consolidate this region, and we want to replicate what we've achieved here elsewhere. And we could do it much, much more quickly now. We have more resources at our disposal. So, yeah, Somalia is definitely on the cards. The other area we're going to be looking at is Eritrea, which is this kind of region here, uh, not including the kind of enclave in Djibouti. The French have a a well-established presence there and we don't want to kind of rock the boat too much we've kind of done that a little bit with zanzibar we have to be a little bit careful there um, eritrea is not a kind of resource rich region at least not yet there's nothing that's been prospected there really um, there is access to coffee um, in coffee um, wool and uh, cotton and this sort of thing in the interior of abyssinia but this area is not very well prospected uh, so I think, you know, on the basis of, of, of prospecting, this area could become more interesting. In uh, Harare, uh, we have a, we're in the process of establishing a trade post, which gives us access to coffee. And we're also going to have fairly good access to coffee in, um, in Yemen. There's three territories that produce coffee. For some time, we've not really had access to this resource. This area has been so volatile, so violent, that it just wasn't cost-effective for us to outlay private capital to establish capitals. We're not willing to kind of... Um, invest in this region unless security was a foregone conclusion because in the 1850s we constantly had trade posts being burnt you know like uh 
missions being kind of burned and, and everyone being kind of strung up and this sort of thing. We don't want that. One interesting thing that has happened is we've had prospecting of coffee in uh, uh, Abba, um, in uh, southern Hejaz. That was a kind of random event. There'll be more of these kind of events that happen. Um, I can't remember where the report is. It may not even happen this term. So we, we're starting to get some results from, based on colonial penetration at Hejaz where new resources are becoming prospected. So again, um, opium and coffee... Uh, you know, we, we're looking to establish ourselves to being sort of reasonable players, especially in terms of opium. But coffee, we would we'd be able to produce once this region is properly exploited, more than enough to meet our own domestic demand, and maybe in the future establish us as a, um, as a kind of a, a, you know an exporter for that commodity. Um, no real change in the Persian Gulf. Um, the key thing I keep looking at really is sort of Qatar. That's the area of most concern. It is in our kind of sphere of influence but the british have a lot of colonial penetration there and there's not much that we can really do we have to just kind of sit tight we are we, we continuously play cards here but they don't really yield very much so we you know we send missions or not missions um colonial merchants and such and yeah it, it's not yielding very much but uh it will happen it will you know it's one of those things that good things come to those who wait sort of thing uh one thing we are doing is engaging in a, in a big kind of bribing operation and we've got a lot of state revenue now this gold exchange mechanism He's slowing down the amount of private capital accumulation, but we're okay with that. We've got a lot going on already in terms of the economy, but it allows us to bleed some of that money into the state purse. That gives us really, really big options in terms of what we can do. So we're outlaying a fairly significant amount of money now with a view to actually consolidate the hedges. We're going to start getting a military presence. We already have a bit of a military presence in Medina. Um, now, we are at peace uh, with the kind of uh, uh, the tribes, the tribes in this area, but they do have pretty much full military control outside the town we will look to reverse that and to establish ourselves militarily in medina at some point soon and um, we're going to yeah we're going to be looking for full colonial status for hajiz in the next couple of years i think um yeah that's it in terms of sort of colonial business that's pretty much all that's going on the army modernization um is pressing ahead and only other thing really is kind of foreign policy there's a couple of interesting things happen one the war between Russia and Austria is continuing, and it looks like Russia's not doing too badly. It's got it's got a bit of a foothold into the Carpathians. Initially, the Austrians appear to make gains, but they've been hurled back. And uh, the fact that this is continuing is good to see. It's not a flash in the pan. It's looking like it could be a fairly kind of protracted conflict. So we'll keep an eye on that. Um, it looks like the uh, the Austrians are besieging uh, uh, Kishinev, uh, Kish I think, uh, the town in Bassarabia. Um, there's a Russian force. It looks like a generic fortress kind of garrison. It's not a fortified town, but anyway, they're besieging uh, Bassarabia. Uh, the Russians have got quite a few endless distractions. They, they're currently looking at a, a fairly significant revolt um, in the southern Caucasus, which has captured uh, Kutais and also Baku. Uh, we'll keep an eye on that. One of the things we have to keep in mind, as we've seen with the Polish situation, is if these revolts spread, uh, we don't want that happening. You know, we don't want Russia looking to try and liberate cars, for example. We've got a good military presence. At Eastern Anatolia, it's pretty long odds. We had our own revolt actually, whilst this triggered in Bitlis. It was very mild, very small. We detached the cavalry division from Hussein Avni's force south under the command of, in fact, we sent the Guard Corps, I beg your pardon, under Namik Pasha, and he quickly dealt with that. Um, so, yeah, we'll see how much of a distraction this is for Russia, but Russia seems to be doing okay against Austria. Uh, there are signs of pillaging fairly deep um, in, in, in sort of the Austrian Empire and Slovakia. Uh, this could just be kind of light raiding forces, Russian Cossacks, this kind of thing, maybe raiding, penetrating deep into Austrian territory. But what this might mean is we might possibly this year be looking to conduct a move against Austria. I'm anxious to do it because we have just come out of a very long and very bloody war with Austria. Um, so there is a there is a base reluctance to do that. But at the same time, we have to look at kind of options long term for how we can remove Austria as any kind of substantial threat to us. And there is no better time to do it whilst it's fighting our other opponent. I mean, Russia's unlikely to declare war on us whilst they're engaged in a war with Austria. You know, So, worst case scenario is we invade Austria, Russia and Austria make peace, and Russia declares war against us. That would be not good. But as, if we can pull off fairly quickly an occupation of Vienna, that would be key. Now, at the moment that we declare war on them, the done thing is to wait a fortnight, really, to allow them to receive and to respond to the declaration of war. Uh, now, you can do what's called a sneak attack, which is to say we uh, deliver a declaration of war and simultaneously move our troops. That does happen. You know, it happened with Japan in 1905, of course, and they moved against Russia. You know, other powers do take a dim view of this. 
it does hit our kind of relations it's not seen as the dumb thing uh, so they like to see a more traditional declaration of war where they allow of course the problem with that is it allows them militarily a little bit to respond and to firm up the position in Vienna the idea is we are going to develop a war plan now some videos ago I was talking about developing war plans for different factions and then events rather took over so we're going to be looking at war plans white and there'll be a, a white, white timarit which is to say an offensive campaign plan uh, for the Austrian Empire which will be the first set piece plan that we're going to develop and look to possibly implement this year the, the basic gist of this plan is we have six field armies, five of them in the Balkan Peninsula or um, Adrianople. One of them is located in eastern Anatolia, but we only have five three-star generals at this time. So to that end, we we're going to be looking to concentrate two of the armies um, in Plevna. Uh, one of them with a commander, the other one will be in the fortress, basically, without a commander. It will constitute a mobile reserve. The purpose of this army is really just to hold a defensive position, okay? on the Danube, if possible, if this, this situation here looks very vulnerable for the Austrians, uh, to push north into uh, Valachia and conduct the siege of Bucharest. But for the most part, this is just security. This year, a lot of the kind of funding uh, that we've been plowing in to the Balkan Peninsula will begin to yield results. We've seen a fort extension will be complete in however many days. Uh, it doesn't really make it clear. Uh, it doesn't look like it's got long left. Anyway, in fact, if we just hover over here, it will say... Uh, 60 days left for fort extension in Sofia. Uh, we've got 60 days remaining for fort extension in Plevna. So these are mostly fort extensions. Fort upgrade in Constanta, that's different. Constanta was already a fairly large fort. So this will now be a fortress that is kind of like Adrianople or Constantinople. It'll be a big modern kind of fortress. That'll be complete in 90 days. I mean, in the last six months, we've plowed a huge amount of our state revenue into modernizing and upgrading our military capacity principally defensively in the Balkan Peninsula were you alive at this time and you were traveling around Bulgaria or northern Greece it would be something that would be noticeable it'd be palpable to be you know we've injected something like 200,000 troops in total in garrison forces into these regions and they're all moved on trains so you'd see a huge number of soldiers moving on trains a huge amount of military infrastructure being put into place a lot of engineering works and stuff like this plus the extension of the rail line so this would have been a hive of activity and this replaces the what have been hitherto a somewhat decentralized ottoman presence with local kind of rulers and things like this not quite the system of the bays that was reined in but we're now implementing much more direct control really elaborate military apparatus is being put into place with a view to hold our position in the Balkan Peninsula. This is going to be a real, the, you know, I think the real kind of target for either Russia or Austria. So war plans, uh, white topaz, then will call for two armies to hold a position on the southern Danube. We'll be expecting a siege of Constanta, but the Constanta will be reinforced to such an extent that there's currently a relatively small French force. The French do we have given the French access rights with a view to have good relations with them. Uh, one of the things that does also is it functions as a bit of an early warning system. If one of these powers suddenly sort of um, cancels their access rights, then that could have ramifications. That could mean something. Um, we've got a fairly decent kind of garrison force in place, 50,000 men, plus we'll probably add some additional guns, plus once the fortress is modernized, it's a large modern fortress, that would probably create an additional 50,000 men as weapons are handed out to the men of that city. In the event of a, of a siege, uh, we'll be able to muster a large part of the population of our city. So you've got 100,000 men. That's the size of a full field army defending a large modern fortress with emplaced positions. That would be really hard for Austria to take that. Even if they had like 300,000 and they assaulted it, they would suffer catastrophic losses in the event of trying to take that city. This then buys us time. Calcifying the Danubian frontier uh, buys us time. And we're going to be looking to field four field armies in Bihach, in northern Bosnia, just off of Sarajevo. We send them our declaration of war, and we conduct a forced march with three of the commands. We'll go through Zagreb, Marburg, Vienna. One of the commands, we'll go to Zagreb, Marburg, and cut right and screen uh, the Danube at Buda, um, but if you like, the kind of uh, half of Budapest. These two cities are now just known as Budapest, but at the time, uh, Buddha. So we'd be looking to secure the kind of, um, yeah, the western bank of the Danube, uh, north of the Drava, and this allows us to kind of screen our march onto Vienna and to hold a defensive position. This is also a victory location, so holding Hungary is also a desirable thing to do. In the event that this operation comes off within a fortnight, we can't do it straight away. We have to basically wait a fortnight to 
not going to be a sneak attack. We're not going to go crazy and upset everyone. You know, um, we're going to do it in a kind of in a respectful way. It's going to be a traditional declaration of war. They do have railways, but there's only so much they can bring back to Vienna. Three armies is going to be like eighty thousand men apiece. You know, it's going to be like um, two hundred and seventy thousand, two hundred sixty thousand men. Uh, a quarter of a million men are going to move on to Vienna. They did a large part of their army brought back to Vienna to be able to hold that. Vienna's not fortified, it's no longer a frontier city, so if it comes off, it could be really spicy stuff. And of course, the Ottoman army has just... Uh, and, and it's quite fitting that it's undergone a massive reform at the end of what was a really significant war. The introduction of new weapons, new equipment, you know, gives us a chance to really field test this force. And if this comes off, we seize um, Budapest, or a part of Budapest, and Vienna. We hold this position. Uh, this should hopefully precipitate an Austrian collapse on the Carpathians, give the Russians a bit of a free hand. But we will hold this position, and uh, we will sit here. We'll sit tight. We'll, you know, we'll dig in like a bug, and um, for as long as we absolutely can, to tell you the truth. And the, the hope is, it precipitates the kind, of, same kind of thing it did in the first war, which is to say, a collapse of uh, Austrian national morale, which has ramifications for the cohesion, and combat effectiveness of their field command, and that that will provide the basis long term for us imposing what will be, I'm afraid, this time very harsh terms indeed on the Austrian Empire. They will pay. Um, in territory um, in all kinds of ways uh, for the havoc wrought in the last war. It was a very costly, very bloody affair. And okay, even when, though we won it, we don't have a revanchist position. We're not looking to kind of um, acquire territory. But these, the states that we make kind of independent, a kingdom of Hungary, uh, you know, maybe a Croatia focused around Zagreb, unlike these other principalities which have broken free, these regions will kind of be our protectorates. We will kind of guarantee uh, their independence. And we look to also then bring country, you know, like the Romanian principality into the fold. We'll probably look to recreate a Valachian principality uh, to really, yeah, around Bucharest. And um, we'll do what we can. It would require a long term occupation of central Austria. That would probably also guarantee German unification. It would mean that Austria would be in no position, in no position whatsoever, to actually intervene and to check. Um, Bismarck's ambitions for creating a kind of a single sort of German policy based around uh, this kind of confederations patchwork of kind of principalities and kingdoms. So that's pretty much it for late January 1864. I don't think there's anything else that I'm missing. Um, last section of the kind of Mesopotamian rail line is going in. Within 45 days, we will have um, Baghdad connected um, to... Yeah, Baghdad will be connected to as far west as, uh, as Sofia or Niche, if you want to be pedantic, and ultimately uh, within uh, probably three months, uh, Sarajevo will be connected to Baghdad. So we would have achieved, if you like, the kind of famous Orient Express line many decades before it was actually built. And, you know, this is not built by Western banks or by the Germans. This is built by Ottoman capitalists. This is built by our own ingenuity, our own resources, and this sort of thing. And... Um, the only kind of uh, military infrastructure, um, I should say military, it's, it is military kind of infrastructure, but it's sort of um, the only economic outlay that we've really kind of invested in in the last uh, couple of months since, I think, October or November, is the beginning of an arms shop. One thing I did notice is that manu um, ammunition, we do produce just about enough for our army, but ammunition is, um, it, we pretty much just about make ends meet. Uh, so we're looking to stick in another um, ammunition factory in Sinop, and we do consistently export military equipment now. We're a big military exporter of military equipment. Uh, we will always do that until a time of war. Once once a war is on, we will instantly stop that. And obviously, our armed forces become a focus. But it's something that's absolutely worth doing. Incidentally, Austria is a customer. <laughs> uh, so I'm a little bit kind of um, on the fence about that. But look, the truth is, if they're not, you know, there's no shortage of power selling military equipment. If they're not buying from us, they'll be buying from Britain or someone, or someone else. So it makes sense for our capitalists to benefit from that. They still have reasonable military positions around kind of Belgrade. It's not like they've kind of, um, it's not like they've sent everything to the Carpathians. They've been a little bit cautious, but they have softened their, their position on the kind of Danube. They definitely have substantially less forces. So these forces obviously will be heading more towards the Carpathians, towards the war with Russia. We keep an eye on this. Hopefully this is going to be a long and bloody affair and we'll keep up, uh, keep two of our kind of, uh, our two principal opponents busy fighting each other for some time. And it looks like as this happens, you know, Sweden, I, I, I can't really, I'm scratching my head with regard to the Scandinavian expedition. What it is that kind of uh, that creates this. I don't think Russia has any claims on Sweden. 
or how this came to be. I don't think it's not something that happened in real life. Um, maybe they did. Maybe they did traditionally have a claim that they never really pressed, some sort of claim that's near the kind of duchy of Finland or something like this. But um, in any case, despite controlling Stockholm for some time, Russia has not tried to press any claim. And this has really almost become a running sore. I mean, the Swedes have reacquired control of the huge parts of the their country, probably on the basis of Russia evacuating forces, sending forces south towards the Carpathians, but um, yeah, it's slightly bewildering as to why Russia hasn't kind of uh, just sought a peace deal with the Swedes, or maybe the Swedes simply aren't accepting, I don't know. The only other kind of ongoing, well I said not the only other, it's not the only other ongoing conflict, the American Civil War does kind of continue to rage, but it is all but over. Uh, the Confederacy now has been re reduced to a small enclave in Louisiana, around New Orleans, it is a fortified city, um, but they're still holding out in this position. But I think we can say that, really, in a, in a practical sense, the American Civil War is, is over in all but name. And the only other conflict, really, which is continuing, is the Chinese Civil War. It's been an ongoing Chinese Civil War uh, for about a decade now. Um, and you can see that this has created a huge amount of damage in China. I mean, it probably would have resulted in the deaths of just an unbelievable number of people. But it, um, it looks like the kind of rebels, well, the rebels kind of move around. They will control one city. It, it rather seems like the central government in China is, is sort of um, trying to kill a kind of, um, I don't know, trying to kill ants with a fly swatter sort of thing, a mountain of ants. that They simply cannot kind of, you know, if they stamp on one group of kind of rebels, others crop up. Um, it just looks like this is an asymmetric kind of war. It's not like the American Civil War. We have a clear frontier. It's like the Chinese are kind of hopping from foot to foot. And we had a similar kind of experience with uh, early on in the game where you, we had kind of various revolts. And it was kind of, there was a sense of, you were sort of stamping on ants, really. You know, you kind of lift one foot from them to appear elsewhere. And I think China's having a similar kind of experience. Uh, and this is probably something that's tied in perhaps a little bit to the character of the Chinese Empire at this time. Uh, but it's an ongoing conflict. One other thing I've been thinking about is that we're building up a lot of state revenue. Uh, we continue to invest in two lines. That's the wrong uh, tab. Academy of Sciences, we're investing in two lines, two technology lines. One is breech-loaded rifles, the beginning of modern sort of cartridge shell-based firearms. And also we're looking at the Navy now, ironclad and wooden ships. We are behind, I think, a little bit um, in terms of some naval technology. So we're looking to... Mitigate that now through the iron cladding of wooden ships, then we're going to look at iron ships, and then barbettes, iron clad corvettes, iron clad frigates, and so on and so forth. So we're looking to do the same kind of thing with the Navy, make a qualitative leap, and continue to invest in the Army in the background. We don't just stop just because we've kind of uh, achieved this new kind of qualitative leap with regard to our armed forces. This will be the Army reform of the 1870s, which we're investing in now, in 1864. And that's how the way, you know, this is a kind of game that sort of... Um, like a game of chess you plan your moves a long time in advance it's very easy to sit back and think well i'll look at the uh, breech loaded rifle in the 1870s because that's really when you, you begin to see the introduction of breech loaded rifles into our modern armies we want to kind of be ahead of the game be ahead of the curve and if we continuously invest in this we could be looking at breech loaded rifles in 1870 1871 that would make us one of the earlier breech loaded rifle powers really i mean britain introduced the uh Martini Henry, I think, in 1870, 71, 72. It was in the early 1870s anyway. So this would actually make us, you know, it almost put, put us at the forefront. Again, it's combined uneven development. And a lot of other areas are going to be really, really behind. But it's sort of um, classic combined uneven development. You know, we'll have some areas where we'll be doing really, really well. And other areas where we'll gradually fall behind. And we'll have to kind of, as our economy grows, we'll be able to invest m more and more in different lines of kind of uh, research. Now, one thing I've been thinking about is investments in education. And thinking it doesn't really improve literacy or well, literacy climbs by a small amount and then gradually descends again and i kind of fathomed why in my mind so it sits at around 15 percent we invest in education it climbs to about 17 18 19 percent for a couple of months and then it begins to gradually go down as the effects of our education investment uh, begins to subside and i've realized why it's because education in the ottoman empire is restricted it's really just there for the ruling class, for the kind of upper middle class, for the aristocracy. It's not something you have to keep in mind that education really before the 1860s, before, if you look at the 1869 Education Act in Britain, um, it wasn't really viewed by anyone as something that, you know, it wasn't seen as desirable that most people were literate or anything like that. It just wasn't seen as a meaningful thing to kind of um, invest in education. The idea of comprehensive education before this period, in some respects, was quite alien. You began to see it more in Northern Europe. In Prussia, it was quite important, and Bismarck attributed the success of the Prussian army in both the Austrian War and the French War to these, what he termed, these literate ranks, 
the literate ranks and files of, the, uh, of his army. And that was something that was quoted in Britain and the British Parliament. I think the uh, Bismarck quote was after the Austrian War. This was quoted in the British Parliament when discussing the 1869 Education Act, which is the introduction of comprehensive education. It's not something that all societies consider, though. The Ottoman Empire is not a society that really looks to the idea of it really being interested in the introduction is, is a, a sort of comprehensive education. As such, improvements in education is really just investing in the kind of university system that we have, which is fairly limited um, to really the wealthy. It's a restricted form of education, and that won't really change. Um, it won't. I mean, I think if it's the case where almost all citizens will receive at least some form of education, if that is something that's kind of hardwired into the character of our society, as it may be in some respects with regard to Britain or the United States or Germany or even France, then it's different. You know, these societies have much stronger constitutional traditions and maybe the ideas of kind of universal suffrage and stuff like this leads a little bit naturally to the idea of kind of systematic education um, as a means to con control the narrative a little bit, but also to improve the economy, to provide educated people for clerks and a middle class and this kind of thing. The Ottoman Empire, despite being a mod you know, an increasingly modern and industrial society, simply doesn't take that view. Uh, the ruling class in the Ottoman Empire is still something that we can control does not take the view uh, that people should you, sh you should have mass education at all. So investments in education is unlikely to yield much, I don't think, in terms of long-term improvements in literacy. I think literacy ratings will remain fairly high, and that this is a systemic feature of the Ottoman Empire that we can't really change. We're still going to invest in education because it does provide short-term boosts uh, uh, in literacy, which has an impact on research, but also because it's an effective way of um, of kind of depressing or suppressing militancy and this kind of thing, keeping uh, satisfaction relatively high, especially amongst those people that it's aimed at, which in this case, in the Ottoman Empire, is going to be aristocrats, capitalists, the middle class, this kind of thing, the people that receive education. So a bit of an afterthought education, because I had talked about investing in education on a kind of annual basis. We are going to continue to do that, but also we have to have a bit of a sense of proportion about really the likely impact that that's going to have. That's pretty much it for that, this business report then of late January 1864. There's usually something that I always remember once I kind of end the video, but if there is, I'll uh, stick it in the next video. But um, next uh, next update report then will be maybe sort of um, any time between March and May. You know, we'll do kind of like a, um, yeah, kind of spring um, kind of report then in a few months' time. So thanks for watching this video, and I'll see you in the next one.